could provide universal access to everybody with their cable television markets. Yeah, I think it has some economic benefits as well as some social benefits. My vote is absolutely without a doubt universal access. Mr. K, does it make a difference if you have universal access? Or, that is, or is it just a pie in the sky theory? Uh, no, I think uh, just as we have the last hundred years ago, we've had universal access to public libraries. It's something that all of the citizens of the country should amortize over the joint wealth. I think the most haunting image to me is a library I visited 20 years ago in the middle of a slum. Uh, it was free, but nobody was going into it. And so I think that information is one thing, and the will, the hope, the directions, the reasons for actually using it uh, as elements of powers are what have to be worked on first. Although I think while we're at it, we should definitely make sure that everybody is enfranchised in the new sources of information. Mr. Kavner? Yeah, I, um, in the last panel, uh, Steve Case, I think, made a very important uh, observation that a lot of what we're talking about is uh, allowing people to communicate with other people in new, in new ways. And that um, when you think about universal access and what we have today in terms of today's communication system, I think we need to make sure that we bring forward into this new world where the the communications with our eyes as well as our ears, uh, the ability of all people uh, to communicate, because what we're talking about is creating new sense of community. I think the question for us on the panel is how, because it's a tricky thing. You know, I know how it was done for the communications network. We had a regulated monopoly, and the government regulated the Bell system to see that everyone in America, no matter whether they lived on a farm or an inner, inner city or in a suburb, had access to a lifeline type of services. And that worked and achieved a certain goal. We will not have that in this new world. And so the, the challenge for us is to, to hold the value of universal access for, for all the appropriate reasons, and then to noodle through during this pioneering period uh, the mechanisms to allow people to form new senses of uh, of community. I think the Bell Atlantic TCI announcement is a, is a good statement of intent to, to begin that. And just to add something there, that's going to be, from what I understand, in the public schools, not private schools. The original proposal was for public and private, but this is uh, empowering public schools. So, again, obviously some decisions have already been made. Ms. Kaplan, how do you feel about this issue? When you talk about universal access, who pays for it? Should the government regulate it? Or should free market take over? Free market will not result in universal service. We know that from telecommunications in the past, and we can expect that in the future. One group that has consistently been left out of past definitions of universal service are people with disabilities, a group that we have become more and more cognizant of through measures like the Americans with Disabilities Act and also because our society is aging and more and more people who are going to learn to depend on this technology will find that they may not be able to use it. Mr. Diller gave a great little anecdote in the beginning of the last panel about the interface with remote controls and how difficult they currently are to use. Um, that is something that many people commonly experience some more extremely than others. We are, are currently paying, government is paying, um, and ratepayers all over the country for an add-on system so that deaf people can use the telephone through state-mandated relay programs that are using operators to provide a service that other people can do without operators now. In California alone, the cost is $24 million a year for this service, and you multiply that by 50 states and it becomes very expensive. We've learned through architectural design that it's very expensive to retrofit accessibility or usability in for people with disabilities. And what we're learning is that when we build accessibility in to the blueprints, and we're at the blueprint stage of the information highway now, that we don't just save money. We enlarge the market who we're selling products and services to. We make sure people get left in. And we also have the key to ultimate user friendliness. If people with disabilities can use it, then everyone can use it. This is something that government should mandate and something that all should pay for, because all will benefit from. 
that all should pay for and government should mandate. Do you agree with that, Mr. Caper? Well, I think that just as we've had universal access uh, for telephones for the last 60 years, it's pretty uncontentious uh, that some form of uh, a guaranteed right to get a service brought into the home uh, is, is going to happen. There's a question of, of, of who pays for it. But I want to raise another question in, on access, which is access to what? If it's access to the cubic zirconium network, it's not all that interesting. How many people here have email addresses? Could I see some hands? Quite a few. My bet is, if we came back in five years, 80 to 90 percent of you would have email addresses, if things go well. The big question about access is, are we going to have access to a future that consists only of 500 channels of what somebody else says that you should be watching, or will it be access to a great diversity of services in which we're not so much treated just as consumers buying things, but also as citizens, and in which we as citizens at the local level uh, and uh, creative artists and entrepreneurs all have a chance to put content onto that network. That's a network worth having access to, and that's the kind of network we should be building. Sounds but great. That, but how do you do that? Ruth, go ahead. Doesn't it seem absolutely inevitable that that'll happen, given what's happened already and what the technology fosters? If, if, if I thought it were inevitable, I, w I wouldn't be up here. I mean, we live in a world <laughs> I mean, um, in which people can literally talk about uh, packaging and storing experiences so that it, be con it can be consumed on video servers. I find that pretty frightening. I don't think experience is the sort of commodity that can be packaged like that. And to the extent that there's a mentality that winds up reducing everything to a least common denominator and to economics and to money and believes in pushing for mass audiences because that's the only kind of audience that's understood, that's very problematic. I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I think we have control of the future to shape it in our hands, but we just can't sit back. But the, but the, but the possibilities are so in that direction. I mean, the, what the technology will allow us to do is to introduce people to subjects through video or conversation or images or, you know, conversation with a professor and, and facilitate that. The, the possible, just say one more thing about this and give other people a chance. The possibilities are infinite and exciting. And if you go out on the internet and you do net surfing, or if you can find some very bright 19-year-old who understands it already and can deal with all the, all the weird interfaces of it to show you, you get viscerally really excited about it. But you know, every time there's been a new medium, whether it was radio or television or cable, there have been the same high hopes, lofty aspirations. This is going to be terrific for culture. It's going to be terrific for education. And it hasn't materialized. And until we understand how to make it different this time, it's just living in a fool's paradise to believe that utopia is around the corner. I, I really agree with that. Uh, I mean, the term couch potato is now thought of being so neutral that it was actually used as the title of the previous session. That, to me, that is disgusting. And what we're looking forward to is not couch potatoes, but mouse potatoes. We don't want more mouse potatoes uh, in the world. We have to have some way of changing the value system of the culture, not just changing the access. All I agree with Mitch that we don't want 500 channels or 1,000 channels. We want one channel, one channel that connects to everything, and then some values that will get us to look at more than uh, just uh, shiny, interesting things on a shopping channel or whatever. I think that right now, we're, if you look at uh, America over the last 20 or 30 years, there's an interesting phenomenon that is going on in the, under the guise of convenience this and convenience that, convenience foods. What people are getting are things of lower quality. And after a generation has passed, they don't know it's lower quality anymore because that is what they know. So when we shape an entire environment here, we're also shaping a set of values for people. And people will pick up the values from the environment just as they have from television. So a lot more care than private enterprise usually puts in has got to go into thinking about what this thing is. This is the biggest thing that has happened since the printing press, and we have to do it with thought. Television should be the last medium to ever be allowed to be invented naively without a Surgeon General's warning on it. <laughs> we have to make sure that the computer medium is one where people understand 
when it is really appropriate to use it, when it's powerful, people, so that people can tell the difference between education and entertainment, not just slam them together in such a way that education is lost. Did you suggest ex experiments, if you will, information town hall meetings so everybody will understand what this highway is about and what it's supposed to do? Is that how you gather information from people and learn what they want to see or what they, they should be seeing to use it in a more viable way? Well, here's, here's, a, here's an arena in which I think you really ultimately do have to put your trust in the marketplace. If you are willing to build a network that is genuinely open, not just to consumers of information, but to providers, such that anybody who has something to say or to make something, no matter how foolish we might think it is, has a chance to do that and get on, whether it's educational or health or entertainment or whatever, then we'll very quickly learn and be surprised by the results. We have the experience of the computer industry, where I come from. Nobody predicted the invention of the applications like the spreadsheet that I was involved with or desktop publishing that made that industry. Sperry and Burroughs and CDC and other companies that are no longer in business did not sit around in symposia like this telling everybody what it was going to be like. And if they had, they would have been wrong. The way that you create the future is you lower the barriers to entry for the consumers and the providers, and you try to make as many things happen as possible. And that, yes, that does include government subsidizing education because it doesn't pay for itself, but they ought to be going out and buying net connections on this new broadband highway, just like everybody else. And if the government gives them a grant, great. We'll learn a lot over the next 10 or 20 years about what works and what doesn't work. And that's what we ought to be doing. There are other major players in our society who need to be encouraged and incubated to become information providers, government, Nonprofit organizations. My organization is a nonprofit. We're not techies. We have our own bulletin board service that's on exhibit here, WIDNET. Um, other nonprofits need to do the same. And in this way, we will create more than the infotainment uh, network of the future, but we will create experiments that will lead to directions that underlie the values that we were talking about that give people good positive values from the institutions that we really rely on to keep our society going in the direction it needs to go in. I, I think if I can sort of come to the defense to some extent of the industry when, when we're talking about this information highway, you've got to apply a little bit of the, the Willie Sutton theory to this. You know, you've got to do things where the money will come from. You just can't build something and, and a field of dreams hope they will come. Somebody's got to be able to pay for it. So some of the applications that the industry is talking about initially are those things that will generate some revenue stream that will allow the tremendous capital investment that's going to be necessary to make this highway a reality. So when you talk about shopping and video on demand and electronic uh, banking transfer or virtual reality, whatever you're talking about, there has to be an economic component to it to get to that other level. And I, and I would hope that we would not sort of uh, thumb our noses at those applications because they are, if you want to put it that way, necessary evils to get this highway constructed. Uh, so we have to look at those things as a, as a step to building this highway. But once that's done, we still have to make sure that people have access to a fundamental basic level of communications, interactivity within the society. And, and somebody's got to pay for that. I think the industry will step up and pay its fair share. I think taxpayers would pay their fair share. And to some extent, users should pay their fair share. And the other thing I think we need to, uh, to be careful about is some sort of, we were talking about the value system. Who's going to be the keeper of the flame? Who's going to decide the values? What values should be available? For example, in this society, I don't believe politically, you could mandate that the Super Bowl become a pay-per-view event. I don't think you could do that politically. But at the same time, heavyweight boxing, championship boxing, is a pay-per-view event. There's a value judgment in there. Some people decide boxing is not valuable enough so they should have universal access. But the Super Bowl is. There's some value judgments being made there, and there are other examples like that. So I believe that we have to not only determine the value system, but we also have to have some input and to say who's going to decide what those values are. Let's talk about a downside, if you will. Um, Someone could possibly bring forth the argument, well, we're going to create a generation of people who sit around pressing buttons as to going out and, say, using that public library that Alan Kay is talking about. Do we have an opportunity here for this super information highway to become 
the savior of, of education as we know it, or could it turn in the opposite direction? I mean, it sounds great for a, a student in Southern California to be able to read a book in the Library of Congress. Will that student do that? Is that going to improve education well, I think the, for kids who need it? I think one of the ways of thinking about it, a, a different perspective, is if you remember Socrates didn't like writing. There's a big long complaint about it. We, we revere writing today, but Socrates said, uh, the problem with writing is that somebody, uh, it forces you to follow arguments rather than participate in them. So he thought of writing as distancing. And he, the thing he really didn't like about it is that the person who wrote the argument down could then go off and die and never be able to be talked out of it. So this thing, <laughs> this thing that Socrates, so there are lots of different perspectives. And of course the book, has been thought of as a very alienating technology in d different cultures as well. So I don't think it's necessarily the, the alienating aspect of the technologies. It's a question of using it uh, where they're really powerful uh, for larger scale uh, goals. I think the hard thing about any new technology that comes along is finding out what its fundamental idea is, what it actually makes easier to think about and what it makes harder to think about and then uh, have a value system that's set up that way. I don't think anybody can choose the value system. Uh, what I'm urging is that people reach for value systems when they're encountering this stuff. Uh, so when I would like to have a child, uh, for instance, I'd not like to tell a child you have to have a value of reading a book, but I'd love a child to know that he's making a decision not to read a book and instead to go off and do something like that, rather than just not even think about books as being a possibility. The, po the point I make and the point that concerns me is that all the libraries of the world are filled by, uh, are, have been written and, and uh, put together by people who control the dominant values of the society. If you're part of a minority group, your values don't make it into the server. And my big concern is how do you make sure without stimulating the creation of software that has a diversified opinion, how does that get into the server? So that the kid who's sitting there punching up what's in this sort of library server along the information highway can get his or her values transmitted back to him. Uh, Those are the kinds of issues I think we have to address. I think this is a very important point, uh, which is who fills the server? Um, and the servers, it's not one server that's out there. That I think that if we could develop this environment where there are many, many servers, innumerable, always one more tomorrow, um, then we have the opportunity of having um, education servers. I would like to see a lot more energy coming out of the education community in understanding what we're talking about today. The, the, the answer to your question, I believe, is that this environment, the interactive broadband environment is much more on the positive side of education, potentially, than the negative, and that it's ours to screw up. Um, if the education community would rally around building servers, and this may be the, the way tax money moves from traditional forms of education to electronic and traditional forms of education, um, I think we'd all be uh, better off. I if the education community sits back and only allows us to be driven from a commercial mindset, I think we're going to land up. I, I don't think that will happen because you can see today already a great deal of interest. I mean, talk to any teacher. The kids come into school playing Game Boy and watching TV and open to a world of technology that our schools today don't have and and I know for a fact that many of the leading educational groups are extremely concerned to have children have access to video on, on a rainforest or on a tiger on anything that could begin a conversation and perhaps lead them to a book and I think I mean obviously I can't speak for them but I know many of them are extremely um, excited about that possibility and facing the everyday fact that Almost most of our classrooms have one outlet, right. don't have computers in them, schools don't have phones, they don't have voicemail. I mean, there's a tremendous infrastructure upgrade that yeah, has the, to happen. The majority of schools in America does not have a telephone system in the building. I mean, it is not wired for communication. One phone in the office. Yeah. Mr. Caper. Uh, I was going to say there are some lessons from economics about how to make this medium good for education. You have to make it as cheap as possible. You have to drive the cost down. 
And in that sense, you want a mass market. You want everybody in the country, actually everybody on the world, on this kind of network. And in that sense, uh, building it in order to deliver video on demand and uh, uh, home shopping is great because it's going to help pay for it. That's necessary. The key question is whether the systems that are, are built in the private sector and owned and operated, where those private sector companies also control a lot of the content, whether they also have a full stranglehold on everything else or whether there is a kind of public right of way down the information highway. Whether we find some way to preserve the principle of common carriage. Yes, let's get rid of all the regulatory baggage that has really hampered innovation. And I think the Vice President, I hope, will have a number of interesting things to say about that no, concretely. Sure but you have to let everybody onto the network who wants to. And if they want to put up a server, let them put up a server. We have enormous diversity in print compared with broadcast today. A half a million books in print, 100,000 different periodicals. That begins to approach diversity. Yes, you've got a lot of noise. Yes, you've got a lot of problems. But 500 channels is not diversity. We have to be prepared for chaos, because there's going to be chaos. And we have to be prepared for noise, because not everybody that you know, pipes up and says something is going to do it either with good production values or in a way that we find agreeable. And so the policy bedrock for this, to get to your question, is really the First Amendment, which says that we want to encourage maximum freedom of speech. Let's get clever with technology to give parents controls so that if they don't want kids to watch things, kids have to sign in with their own remote. And on that remote, there are certain channels that just don't show up. I mean, we can get very clever about that. But if we try to start imposing values, either from the government or private sector, fearing government intervention, and saying, well, we have to police ourselves. If we do that in a way to say there are certain things you can't say and certain things you can't do, we're going to lose an enormous amount of the value. The weird ideas in society that start on the fringes migrate into the center in two or three generations. That's how we got women's right to vote. That was a radical, disgusting idea about 100 years ago. Go back and read the history books. If we have an open network, a lot of the weird, radical ideas that we find today to be totally unacceptable will have the seeds within them 20, 40, 60, 80 years down the road for things that we'll all want to believe in. We need to permit that process to happen. All right. Mr. Kafer, you said everyone should have access to the network who wants to. And we are talking about some violent pornographic material. I think there's been talk of a Heidi Flies channel or something like that. What do you do? Sorry. What do you say parents should be allowed to block this if they want to? How do you get, you know, it's on the responsibility of the parent, right? I can hear some people saying, how do you get everybody to do that? There's going to be some kid who's going to fall through the cracks and watch what he wants to anyway because the parent's not going to be. Well, should we worry about that? It's kind of the original theory of the parent, isn't it? That they're supposed to be responsible. Maybe we should... Uh... Oh, certainly it is. <laughs> but what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I think that in all of these areas we're talking about, including education, that no amount of technology injected into the home in any which way uh, are going to make up for parents who are not interested in learning as a value. And so I think that one of, the, one of the things that we have to be most careful about is, and again, here's where I'm, it sort of sticks in my throat, because I hate the idea of telling other people what they should do. On the other hand, I've seen for 25 years uh, successful schools and unsuccessful schools that I've worked with, and the successful ones all have close involvement with the parents it's a, it's a, uh, a three-way uh, consortium between the parent, the child, and the, uh, the teacher in the school. Those, those three work together, and if they don't work together, the system, none of the other systems can make up for it. And I think the same thing has to be true with, with uh, pornography or um, any, of, any of these other things that we may not like. The parents is part of the heritage of living in this country that the parents are supposed to have a strong say in what, how their children are to be raised. That's why we have so many school boards. We don't want to have a central association for running all the schools in the, in the country. But in order for that to work, everybody has to take much more responsibility than they would in, say, a country like France, in which everything is run from Paris. I think, I think a, um, an issue sort of um, as difficult as that may be in terms of parental control over what you view is the whole question of... Uh, what voices will be allowed to, to have full expression uh, without somebody evoking uh, political correctness 
on the uh, on those opinions and um, this is an issue that I think government policymakers are going to really have to grapple with uh, and I think the First Amendment is the basis on which you should uh, make those kind of decisions but it will be a big issue if the uh, if the questions go to should the Ku Klux Klan be allowed to go on this network and raise hundreds of millions of dollars uh, spinning out what I believe to be hate and negative uh, images uh, vice versa, should uh, uh, groups uh, that you would consider um, negative to women or, 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 or homosexuals, whatever, be allowed access to this main superhighway, and should the cacophony of voices, no matter how negative or how bad, be allowed to just to be thrown out against the society? And you know, I don't know how you make those kind of determinations. Maybe there's still the, the off button on the system, and then maybe they don't, they don't control the off button, so you can still turn it off. But uh, those are things that we'll have to grapple with, and I can assure you that certain members of Congress will not want to vote for this kind of total First Amendment kind of expression, but it's an issue that I think is clearly going to be one that we'll have to wrestle with, privacy and a lot of other things that go along with that. Well, I, you know, this is going to go the other way, though, it seemed to me, that that Ku Klux Klan program is not going to be a broadcast program in this world. Someone's going to be saying, I want to access something. I want to connect. And I want to connect to other people who have that common interest. And I think that it's a dicier First Amendment issue going into this future. You know, in the communications industry today, you know, I think it is fairly clear that the First Amendment is not, um, is totally protected in terms of what you can say on communications networks. Now that you put content in a communications network, should we as individuals of the society be able to access whatever we want? And I think that becomes much dicier. I, I, I hope so. I mean, I can't yeah, really... Exactly. Uh, actually, we have a very strong First Amendment tradition in this country for a couple hundred years, mostly through the print medium. The last 50 years of broadcasting, because of spectrum scarcity, opening the door a crack to very intrusive government regulation of content, vis-a-vis -vis other media, that history with broadcast has been counter to the general support for freedom of expression. We don't really need the First Amendment for popular opinions. We need it for unpopular opinions. And as I was saying, today's unpopular opinion may be hateful in 50 years, or it may be the conventional wisdom. It's the nature of a democratic society to tolerate unpopular opinions. One of the advantages of going to an on-demand, user-controlled environment is that the stuff doesn't get in your face if you don't want to see it. It does lead, though, to potential problems of fragmentation, loss of a mass culture. If everybody is doing their own thing, do we believe in anything? And I think those are the sort of issues that we really need to be focusing on. But let's, let's get the First Amendment in cyberspace, where it belongs. You know, I don't think we can hold the country together by going rigid at any given point in time. We have to learn how to live with flexibility and change. Uh, this century, I think, has been, McLuhan said, this is the century in which change changed. So maybe we can't handle that extra, that extra gear that's going on. But I think that we have, as Mitch says, we have to have absolutely open access. We have to have choice, and we have to have a way for each individual and each family to block out the stuff that they don't want to see. But the whole issue uh, of pornography and objectionable, objectionable programming or speech is something that is predictable. A new medium comes along and you have horror stories about kids getting into areas parents don't want them to get into and then there's call for regulation and there's a call for clamping down. If we can predict those things, I think those companies who want to avoid over-regulation and who want to protect a freedom to be able to have a diversity of programming really need to be looking at what are the first kinds of programs and the first kinds of examples of what this technology will mean that they are putting out. Um, it needs to be more than entertainment in order to create a vision of what the community will be that we will all be connecting. The companies really need to look at partnering, not just with other companies, but with government, with nonprofit organizations, to come up with shining examples, examples that they can point to that aren't pornography and, and people writing hate messages to each other, but examples of the benefits that this technology and the information holds out to all segments of society, 
proactively with community groups now so that we all can participate in creating a vision of where this is going. The biggest problem that we all have is explaining to people who don't have an involvement in this area of what on earth we're talking about. And we're trying to avoid having these bad examples get thrust in our faces. You know, I, have, I have a question. Is, is will, the owner, will the builders of the superhighway, the information highway, have a public interest obligation over 90% of their capacity, 10% of their capacity? You know, how much of it will be contained in a public interest standard that the government will say, you are licensed to use this electronic magnetic spectrum, which is what we are ultimately talking about, whether you digitize it, analog it, you will be obligated to provide this much as uh, public access. Now, on the public access, people can do what they will. You will control 90%, 50%, 60%, and therefore you have some editorial discretion over what you will let on this system or, or let into this server or let into this access system or not. And if you use the models that we've been working with, with in the past, and, and, and to some extent we're always, we have to build on what we know, uh, I don't know how you're going to divvy up that role of responsibility. But can, I, can I just uh, comment? Just a second, Mitch. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Kevin. You want to go, Mitch? Um, thank you. The broadcast model is not the only model. Right. There's the telephone network. Right. The telephone companies don't care what you say. They don't look at it. They're not allowed right. to do that. In the new world, it's not like you've got scarce spectrum. You have virtually infinite bandwidth. And if you run out on one fiber, you can put in another fiber. There is no reason to allocate, to chop things up, to control things. Let people say what they will say and stand aside. The notion of public, act, uh, public interest obligations doesn't work. We have a lot of history to show that it's a very well-intentioned idea, which does not work. On the contrary, figure out how to take common carriage, which is the right of the users of the system to control the content, to do their thing, strip it of all the regulatory baggage that gets in the way of innovation, stand back and make billions of dollars hauling people's traffic around. And by the way, you'll also be able to own some of your own content and make money off that if people watch it. That's the way to go. Uh, I was going to comment very, very similarly to, to, to Mitch. First, you know, I think the values that Deborah and Bob are expressing are important. But I, what, I, what I think is going on here, we have two present day worlds heading for a future world. One present day world is a broadcast world. And if the if the model that is in your mind is a broadcast model that you propel into this future, I think you create the wrong, you, you solve the wrong problem. I, I, I agree with Mitch. I think we're heading more towards a communications type and environment where the power goes to the individual. And then the problem we have that Deborah lays out is it's going to be the individual's choice to access whatever they want, to connect to any other human beings they want to, whether it is a common interest in gardening, whether it's a common interest in a political point of view, whether it's a po common interest on some productivity or gaming or shopping or whatever. And we need to be very careful and delicate that those rights of the ind individual are maintained while we find the mechanisms to deploy the values that, 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 you know, I think you eloquently lay out are necessary. But we can learn from the history, especially of, of cable, and how uh, cable was deployed. There were wonderful expectations uh, that we would have lots of community programming, and we would have more than the commercially oriented programming mm -hmm. that we have. But look at what happened. The community oriented programming and public access was not produced with much money. Community groups were sort of given access to a studio and do what you want without the training and without the capability to put on programming that would be attractive, especially that could stand up to the more fancy produced, more commercially oriented programming. We need to invest, and maybe government needs to do this, although I think private businesses can do this as well, in sources of programming that come from the community that enhance what government is trying to do, that enhance what
the nonprofits I've been talking about are trying to do and give them enough capability, enough know-how and production behind them to be able to compete and to be able to put something out there that people will be drawn to. Does anybody else want to comment on this subject? Because if not, yeah, I'm going like to move on just, to something Just else. one more comment. Alan? I think part of the answer to that is the analogy to desktop publishing, which has changed what kind of thing you can put up. Of course, people have always been able to write. People can put up billboards. But desktop publishing actually allows you to make something that looks like a book that used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make. And I think that is going to extend the development tools for allowing more people to, uh, to make things like the professionals do is going to extend into this media. And I think the, the other capper on uh, what Mitch is saying is that uh, I was one of the original, uh, one of many who helped design the ARPANET, which turned into the internet. And 25 years ago when we were doing it, the telephone was the model that we had, except of course we didn't want to uh, be able to call to places, but to people. But we just wanted to ship bits around. We didn't want to uh, say what it was going to be or anything. The service would just take little packets and move them uh, from one place to another in such a way that when you sent something to somebody, it could get to them regardless of where they were in the world. And what's happened is the internet over the last uh, many years has been growing at the rate of 20% a month. It still is, I believe. Wouldn't you say, Mitch? I think it's. And there are, I think there are almost 40 million computers on the internet now, worldwide, and any of them could be set up as servers. There are hundreds of thousands of servers, but there could be 40 million servers there. And the, the network does not care what you send around because everything is ultimately reduced to bits. And so you have a model in the internet of the kind of thing that could be done. It happens that the backbones for the internet are paid for by the government. The government, I think, NSF had no idea what it was going to grow into. But in fact, every time you get on America Online or CompuServe or something and send somebody to somebody's internet address, NSF, which means us, are paying for a little bit of that transport of the message. That's how universal enfranchisement works on that thing. There's a guarantee that it will try and find any of the networks connected to it uh, or people who are directly on it. So this is, a, this is a, the network that has grown over the entire world without any planning at all. It was started off with something much more like the United States of America, with a constitution rather than a detailed plan. The constitution governed how the thing grew over the years. And I think it's through constitutional strategies that we can get into the future, not with detailed plans and trying to specifically anticipate every part of the future. All right. Uh, turning to something different. What happens when the super information highway moves to your neighborhood? In other words, we hear a lot of talk about video malls replacing brick malls. Is that likely to happen? Should people be concerned about losing jobs? Yeah, actually, a good company to be these days would be a company like uh, UPS. If you look at if you look at the way Walmart Walmart. Uh, is a tremendous success because it changed the balance of the uh, interactions between the suppliers and the shippers and how things were going to be buffered in, uh, in warehouses. Uh, UPS, which is already everywhere, or Federal Express, uh, is in a position to be the major broker for getting small items to you through computer shopping because they already are going by almost every house Right. in America and so the slightly better packing scheme in their cars they can uh, they could uh, in a very economical way deal with small packages at very small cost and so you have this interesting thing that these changes are not are not only electronic but there's a whole set of logistics that you have to look at and the strangest companies wind up looking like big players they really aren't companies like Proc Procter and Gamble because they don't have a a way of distributing. Uh, it's really a company that can get the goods to you overnight uh, that are going to be the biggest uh, players in this, augmented by the electronic network. But, but that's where some of the possibility for attendant services and new employment possibilities might emerge. I mean, yes, maybe not as many people are ringing out the cash register at the local mall, but things like what you're saying, because people will invent all kinds of ways to bring 
new options instead of going out to your home. It's obvious, and they could be very exciting. See an expert tell you about this and then choose to buy it. Um, but it also seems like there's some family kind of experiences going together to eat a yogurt and wander into a bookstore that aren't replaceable either because they're, they're physical and they're, they're part of life too. I think, I think another question is, if probably even a bigger question is, uh, will the neighborhood be there when the highway gets there? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not there now. It's, uh, you know, when we're sitting up here talking about spending hundreds of billions of dollars to rewire America, how much of that money is going to be spent in creating jobs for these people who live in the neighborhoods that are supposed to be the, the end uh, line of that highway? How many people will be brought into the economy by the hundreds of billions of dollars of, of spending that are going to this new technology? How many people will be trained? to work with this new technology. And I think if anything that, the, uh, that this advisory committee uh, that's advising on the information highway, and indeed the industry should be looking at is, how can we, while we're building this highway, create the kind of jobs, create the kind of stability in families and in, and in neighborhoods that will allow us to have customers at the end of the, the construction period. And that's got to be a, a major concern uh, of what we're facing that uh, th that's why I think that the Bell Atlantic TCI sort of approach is, is, a, is, a, is an absolute strike in the right direction because unless the people are there to be employed, to be consumers, to provide some level of security in, in, the, in the neighborhoods, uh, you're not going to see that last mile get to the home. It's going to end up in Georgetown. It's not going to get over in southeast Washington. And that will be the last mile. And these are the kinds of things that you have to, to think of. I, I think that, that we should be experimenting with every kind of way we can on this information highway to see if it can help deal with some of the urban social problems. I don't know if it can or not, but you know, just for example, this is sort of wild. But suppose that a parent could create a system where they could track where their kids are going to be at all times. You know, it, it sounds like you put them in prison and you put these little rings around their shoulder, around their hand. But perhaps that might be necessary today, where you can say, "Gee, I can look on the map. The kid told me he's going over to his neighbor's house. I look at the system. He's not at the neighbor's house. He's down at the local club. I call him on his beeper and say, "Get your butt over to your neighbor's house." You know, maybe that's what you have to do to deal with some of the problems in in the urban environment. But I'm for, I'm for looking at everything, and I think this 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 major shift in how we interact has to be addressed to fundamental social and societal problems today. Right. Sounds like we have an opportunity to save the world here, right? Well, Mitch? You know, first of all, let's not sell any more utopias because we're bound to be disappointed. The trick is, as Alan said, to figure out what this wonderful new medium is good at and what it's not good at. And maybe it is good at helping people figure out where they are. What I worry about, though, is to the extent to which people give up even further on their real face-to-face -face relationships with each other in favor of some new, even more powerful electronic form of addiction. Uh, I mean, we can go one of two ways. The way I see video games going, uh, especially when you can do them over a network, where you have violent, you know, sexualized violence, and I mean, what we see today is just a preview. You could just increase the amount of alienation in society and people's inability to see each other as people a hundredfold through powerful technology. Or, and at its best, we can see seeds of this on the internet today, people are figuring out how to leverage a small amount of face-to-face -face contact over networks so that they are relating to people who have some common interest that they have uh, even though they're not geographically proximate, even though they form a community that is global in its scope, a kind of virtual community. We don't know very much about how to form those and how to keep those together and how to build on them, and I think that actually should be a very important research agenda for social science, because to me that would be leveraging technology in a very positive way to help people be more human. Well, if we become more machine-like because we're interacting with these machines, we all lose. If we can somehow delegate off to the machine the drudgery and, and leave ourselves so that, for instance, teachers stop being policemen and policewomen and can become mentors and guides because the computer is used to help with, with the facts, that would be a terrific outcome. Neither outcome is, is written 
uh, in any book or on any wall, we have to make it. If we sit back, then it's going to be letting somebody else make those decisions. But you know, there's a cartoon of two dogs sitting in front of a computer terminal, and one says to the other, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, <laughs> and behind that cartoon is the reality that because it's an interactive medium and people are already using the internet, uh, people are communicating. One of the larger groups on the net are people with disabilities who tend to face a lot of obstacles and barriers to physically getting out and going places and find the net to be a wonderful place not to be isolated and a wonderful place to connect with other people. That needs to be, tra that reality and promise needs to be transposed against the current reality which is a lot of people not getting out and going anywhere but being couch potatoes and sitting in front of the tube which is not an interactive medium and I don't think that's the reality that a lot of us well some people in this audience do want to encourage but that's not exactly where we want to go. But the marriage is where it's exciting. Like, say you could take any series that PBS does or that Bob does or that we do and say, let people after it interact with the people who did this, put on the Civil War or the people who watch Wings on the Discovery Channel or to any series and let them interact later with the expert write letters and then interact with each other. That's where the video could spur conversations and spur communities of interest groups that I think would you know, bring a richness to people's lives that could be very exciting. Getting back to the question, it's, however, it's not all you, isolation. Do you see other businesses closing down because of the super information highway? Because it is more accessible. Well, going they, out, doing shopping, say going to a, a video store and buying an actual videotape instead of pressing a button and having it show up. I, I think Ruth uh, said two important things in a previous comment and, and just now, but I think the, the kind of environment you just described is where we should be heading. Um, there's probably a more, more of the past and the future than we probably normally are willing to admit. Um, and I think we're all going to go to stores and malls because of what Ruth said earlier in terms of the social side of it. But I do think it is inevitable that more drudgery side of, of merchandising and purchasing will be done through the network, and that will be done interactively, too. I'll be able to call my daughter, I live in New Jersey, and call her in San Francisco and say, Brenda, um, would you like to go shopping for an hour? I have an hour. <laughs> and, and we talk, that's we shop, fun. we talk, we talk, whatever. Um, that's going to happen. And maybe it's not my daughter, Brenda, you know, maybe Someone that Bob knows that I've never met, but we have a common interest at that moment. And, and I think that's the kind of experimentation that we should be doing in this pioneering period. Um, I also would, would just mention that no time in history has there been an open discussion about the next revolutionary change as what we're having now, that there's something about art following life and life following art, we are actually living at the moment a very important part of the process of maybe doing this thing differently. Because this discussion did not exist when we went through other periods of massive change before. So there is, I think, some, some reason to be optimistic and yet be very cautious about it as well. Well, the amount of, or the unlimited amount, I should say, of information that will flow at our fingertips. Should we be concerned at all about um, guaranteeing the right of privacy? Oh, I, yeah, I think we should be extraordinarily concerned about it. I mean, for one thing, when you have a lot of individual choice, the dossier that will be compiled on you and your family as not only to what you watched, but what you bought uh, is going to be extraordinarily detailed. And if there aren't suitable protections, you know that that information is going to be commercially exploited in ways that you, uh, as the subject of that information, will have no control over. And the, the point that I want to make is, b beside the point that you could spend a whole day just on this issue, is there are two types of protections. There are legal protections, 
it is against the law to do X and Y and Z. And there are technological protections, the best one of which is not to collect that information to begin with. In other words, to build privacy into the system through uh, technologies of encryption in a way that lets business get done. In other words, it's one thing you need to be able, if you're the vendor, to charge somebody a dollar or two dollars or whatever it is and to know that they're going to be able to pay if they're not paying on the spot. So you have needs for, for that kind of security and reliability. Typically, we do that through knowing people's identity. Oh, here's my driver's license, you know, here's my credit card and it's got my name on it. The good news is you don't have to have somebody's identity to have that um, security. Uh, we have $20 bills and $10 bills and cash today, and that is one of the great things about cash, is you can go in and buy something anonymously and the merchant takes the money. But it doesn't have all the convenience of credit cards. We could have a form of money on this network that combined the best properties of both. The sort of security and reliability so vendors get paid, but the anonymity so that if people don't want to become one more record in a big database, it just doesn't happen, and they don't have to trust to some law that might or might not ever get passed. That's a pretty contentious statement, what I just said. I know the NSA doesn't like it, uh, and the intelligence agencies don't like that, because if you give people strong cryptography, and if you, bake it into the, if you bake it into the system, then maybe it does let bad guys do things that you can't listen in on. I don't want to minimize the importance of that debate. But I'll just conclude this point by saying that's the debate that we need to have. How do we get privacy technologically as well as legally? How do we balance that against other well, interests? There's also the nice escalation, for instance, between uh, police radar and the kind of sophisticated radar detector you can buy for your car. You know, once, once we were able to spot radar, uh, the police went to lasers. Now they have laser detectors. And I think, I think one of the problems you're always going to have with privacy is that uh, uh, many institutions will ha just have a lot more computing power than any individual, and a lot of the encryption codes are based on problems being theoretically hard. Um, but in fact, uh, most of those are just a bunch of brute force work, and I think that uh, it's, it's just like locks. Locks are not there to be unbreakable. They're there to, to create a certain level of difficulty to keep, you want to keep amateurs out, that's fairly easy with locks, and then there's a a group of professional criminals at each stage of locking that you want to keep out. You just want to make it, make it harder for them. There's a role here for both industry and government. I have a question for the audience. Given that there are a lot of company representatives here, how many people work for companies that have a written, established policy regarding privacy, consumer privacy? Not very many. Um, companies can proactively write their own policies and figure out what the rules are. One of the issues around privacy is consumers have to know what the expectations and what the rules are about information that they're putting out unwittingly or wittingly about themselves. Another major point is that information, it should be assumed, belongs to the consumer and no one else. And unless the consumer proactively does something, not through negative options, where if you don't do something, then everybody learns about you. Unless the consumer proactively does something and says, yes, I want that entity over there to know this about me, it doesn't go. Of course, okay. what I said about lock applies even more strongly towards organizations like the NSA. They can put a lock on data that no amateur could ever uncork. So if they don't want you to find out that they know about something, uh, there is no way that, it, that you would be able to. That's, a, so that's the, uh, the other side of the, the ominous coin. We've well, got a lot there, of reaction. Oh, go ahead. Just, just make another. Well, well, there's nothing about the technology that won't allow all of us to give the customer, the individual, the right to determine how much privacy they want or not want. And I think we also just strive to give that choice to the individual. The individual wants to to be totally private and anonymous, they can do that. There's nothing about the technology that prevents that. If they would like to advertise uh, their shoe size so that people could, could uh, let them know about sales of, of shoes at that size, that's their choice. And so I, 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 I... Well, the problem is that the Bill of Rights that guarantees unreasonable search and seizure was done before telephone wiretapping was invented. So um, I would consider somebody tapping a phone to be unreasonable search and seizure, but it, it's not 
that it's not considered that way by the legal system because it happened afterwards and they decided well we won't just make that part of what that meant when uh, you had to have physical people to go into your house so I think that I think that there are some very gray areas here and I agree with everything you're saying uh, but I think it's one that we have to be cognizant of that uh, anybody who has a wonderful rationalization for why they should find out about you already is uh, and they can have the information uh, uh, locked up in a way that's almost impossible to prove that they have it okay Alan we have about five minutes left we have time for for Q&A one question <laughs> wow uh, is there anyone in the audience with a burning question that you'd like to ask this panel Come to the microphone, please. They're on either side of the auditorium. We've already got a candidate over here. I'm, I'm the one that wanted to ask the question. Oh, I thought you worked <laughs> with us. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? You were giving me signals. I thought you meant, all right, five more minutes. All right. <laughs> hey, go ahead, please. <laughs> Does that mean we have more time? <laughs> That's right. If you don't recall, I'm the person that told you at the last town hall meetings that most of your voters probably most of your viewers probably didn't vote mr juarez oh yeah i remember you mr juarez oh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for showing up yeah that was an, that was that, <laughs> you you i didn't mean to say it that way but they were giving me the sign they gave dick cavett earlier well, no, go ahead. Uh, my point here is to drive to drive home the point of the partnership that miss kaplan and the communities of mr johnson and i'm glad you're there on that panel um, are discussing. I represent the nonprofit network, a LULAC project, and um, the concept of the nonprofit network is to focus on high school students in continuation high schools and share with them this information that's in the newspaper every day and give them some background to telecommunications, past, present, and future, and make them facilitators in their community so that they can go out and enlighten their community about it. And we want to use nonprofit organizations as the end users for what we call a low-tech uh, network that we want to implement. Now, this is a win-win-win situation because in this place, you divert the at-risk youth and those, those in continuation high schools are the next step to the street. You, you divert them from a negative lifestyle and interest them in something that is truly a, it's not a grant, it's not a handout, it's a real opportunity. When we talk about a level playing field here, this is taking advantage of a real level playing field. Do you have a question, Mr. Juarez? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to be funny, seriously. You made some good points. My, I just my, want to know if you have a question. My question that. is, is this the panel that will advise whomever they are out there developing this highway that that at-risk youth need to play a part in the role of facilitating this so-called communication revolution and if so please take that message forward thank you mr juarez robert yeah, I, i'm a member of the panel and i think you remember the panel also. I, I am also and then yeah, so you, there are a lot of panel members up here and i and I, I i think you're absolutely right i think if you trace the, the the concern i have is that if you trace the development of communications in this country it has to be traced to the economic opportunities that are presented to certain uh, different groups um newspapers developed black americans didn't own newspapers radio licenses were granted black americans were not granted radio licenses when they were when they were granted Television licenses were granted. Black Americans were not given television license. Telephone company franchises were created. Black Americans did not run telephones. Uh, cable television systems were awarded. Very few black Americans owned cable television systems. Now comes the information highway, PCN, PCS, information highway. I don't believe it will be an absolute common carrier model. There will be strong ownership controls simply because if we wanted a common carrier model, the government can build a common carrier like they build the uh, highway, the real highway, the road highway. They're not going to do that. It's going to take private money. Private money is going to demand, control, and return on investment as they should. Consequently, I think there has to be an effort made to ensure that diversity of ownership continues to go right along with diversity of ideas. 
Without diversity of ownership, you will not get diversity of ideas, I can assure you. So my, my pitch is that uh, as a member of the advisory committee, universal access will be a, a mandate that I will push for, as well as diversification of ownership of the technology, ownership of the media that will, I think, will stimulate the diversity of ideas that will get into the server, that will get back into the society, that will stimulate a greater communications and discourse in a, in a democratic, pluralistic society. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, there's a young lady at this microphone. I'm a teacher. 85% of the teachers teaching today have no training in technology. If you think that library that people didn't go to because it was in the middle of some community where people couldn't read very much is bad, you should know that there are a lot of teachers who would love to do the technology, but it's very difficult because 95% of our time is spent in front of students. What can the industry help us do to become ready for this superhighway? Yeah, I've been waiting for that question all uh, the panel time. I think it's the most important question there is uh, about this stuff with regard to education after the values question. One, I work with teachers for 25 years and one thing, things that is abundantly clear when you work with teachers is that they work like mad and they're busy all the time just prepping for their class. It's very, very difficult to help them in a couple of weeks in the summer get the kind of fluency that they need. Uh, in Japan, uh, a teacher in Japan only teaches half the day. They have twice as many teachers per student as we do. And the other half of the day that all of the teachers who are not teaching learn about new things. Thank so you. one of the things that we really have to do in reforming education, again, it's not so much a technological thing, it's a social thing, is to value the teacher's time of having to spend continuous, on-the-job, paid time learning about this new stuff. All right, I have, I've been given a hard rep and don't want to impede on the Vice President's time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to serve as a moderator for such an enlightened panel. Weren't they great? And thank you, audience. Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh. One more time for a stretch. We're going to strike the set, and the vice president will be out in about five minutes. So stretch time one more time. You're watching coverage of the day-long Superhighway Summit held Tuesday at the University of California at Los Angeles. This event examined the future of information and entertainment technology and was held by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Speaking next, Vice President Gore, who spoke about the potential of the so-called information highway linking homes nationwide. Vice President Gore's speech lasts about 45 minutes. He then takes questions from the audience. Okay. This is the uh, most on-time event in the history of uh, Hollywood, I think. Um, to, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker today, we have one of California's two United States Senators, Barbara Boxer. Barbara has uh, served in the United States Congress for 11 years first as a congresswoman from the Bay Area until she began her term in the Senate last year. She has spent her political career as an outspoken advocate of common sense and efficiency. Thanks to her, we all became aware of the $7,600 coffee pots that the Pentagon was buying, and it is estimated that her bill to require competitive bidding by the de Defense Department has saved taxpayers more than $1.5 billion. Um, yes. <laughs> Senator Boxer will be introducing Vice President Gore. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Academy to thank the Vice President from, for coming here today. He is perhaps the most knowledgeable political leader in the nation with regard to new technologies in general and the information superhighway in particular. 
For this reason, President Clinton has made him the administration's point person on this incredibly important issue. It is an extreme honor to have him with us today. And now it is my honor to introduce Senator Barbara Boxer. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you. I am glad somebody got this box. It would be like, remember when Queen Elizabeth spoke to the Congress and all you saw was this? That's the way it would have been. It's an eerie thought. <laughs> Well, I really want to thank uh, Richard Frank and the Academy for all of the work uh, that they have done to put together this historical event, which is so crucial to California's future. And I want to thank our UCLA host, the Center for Communication Policy, and recognize the important work of its founders, Jeff Cowan and Jeff Cole. I think they deserve some praise. I am honored and grateful to be with all of you today to make just a very few remarks and to introduce our great Vice President. I think it's particularly appropriate that today's event is brought to us by the entertainment industry and academia, two California institutions that will play such a vital role in our nation's information highway. Make no mistake about it. The communications revolution has the potential to create economic opportunity, thousands of jobs, and greatly enrich our educational system, our healthcare system, and our quality of life. Experts project that after the highway is in place, U.S. companies could sell an additional $3.5 trillion worth of high-tech goods in the beginning of the year 2001, 2002, around that period. Many project that by the end of the decade, three quarters of all new jobs will be in telecommunications. And by the year 2010, some estimates show that nearly one third of California's economic output will be dependent upon the computer and information industries. The revolution will happen, but the question remains, who will drive it? As a United States Senator from California, I say, let it be California. We need it, and we deserve it, and we're ready for it. During the last half century, the public and private sectors invested heavily in our military, and California's best and our brightest went to work creating the finest defense industry, notwithstanding some of the problems we had, in the world. Well, the Cold War is over, and I say that California is in the best position to lead again in this era of change. California led the defense buildup. Now let's lead the information buildup. From semiconductors to Seinfeld, from Silicon Valley to Schindler's List, this is the state that can make it happen. Just last year, our cutting edge computing industry employed over 90,000 Californians. And as trade deficits threaten so many parts of our economy. American movies, TV programs, and home video materials continue to be the envy of other industries by creating trade surpluses of over $4 billion. We are the state with the best higher education system, and we better keep it that way. Thank you, UCLA, for applauding. We are the state that brings the world entertainment and we are the state that sparked the computer revolution. Now, if we seize this opportunity, and I think we're going to do it, the marriage of entertainment, education, and information will be a match made in heaven for the California economy. Pac Bell just announced it will invest $16 billion in an information superhighway for California. Caltech just linked itself to UCSD with a high-speed data network. And in the Silicon Valley, the public and private sectors have joined together in a project called Smart Valley. In the golden state, this golden state, the revolution has already begun. In California and nationwide, information will be the lifeline bringing services to and between our people and our institutions. I pledge as a United States Senator to work with this great administration, with all of you, and with this nation's consumers to make sure that this superhighway increases access, protects privacy, 
and gives our business, our educators, our medical institutions, and our law enforcement officers the tools that they need to flourish in this new kind of global economy. And now I have a superb honor to introduce to you the Vice President of the United States. President Clinton, in his wisdom, has given Vice President Al Gore some of the most important assignments in the history of our republic. And with good reason, he brings a wealth of intelligence and experience to the job of Vice President. This is a man who is a nationally recognized leader on technology, a man who has spent most of his political career laying the policy bricks to build today's communication foundation. As a senator, Vice President Gore introduced and steered to passage the High Performance Computing Act, legislation that created a national high-speed computer network and increased the R&D of high-performance technologies. This important legislation is part of President Clinton's technology and economic initiative. As the Vice President of the United States, Al Gore is working overtime to ensure that government serves as a partner and not as an obstacle in this communications revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I am so very proud to introduce to you and to welcome to California the Vice President of the United States of America, Al Gore. Thank you very much, Barbara. It is a, it's a great privilege to be able to work with Barbara Boxer. We work together in the House of Representatives, and we have been great friends for a long time, and she does an outstanding job for this state. Uh, she is tireless and determined and really uh, does a super job. Uh, uh, along with Dianne Feinstein, uh, she makes up uh, one of the most effective and best teams in the Senate that any state in our union has. I want to uh, acknowledge also uh, Congressman Howard Berman, who I'm told is here. I haven't had a chance to visit with everyone uh, beforehand, so there may be others I should acknowledge, and I apologize if I've uh, missed someone. I, I also want to uh, thank Rich Frank, president of the Academy, uh, for uh, his help in uh, arranging this and making this uh, tremendous gathering possible and Andrea Rich, uh, Vice Chancellor of UCLA, for her hospitality and help. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, some of the administration officials who are here. The chairman of the FCC, uh, Reed Hunt, technically not, I, I said administration official, uh, part of the, uh, the chairman of the independent FCC, and Dan Golden, director of the, uh, <laughs> that's not supposed to be a laugh line, I guarantee you. <laughs> and, uh, the director of NASA, Dan Golden, who is, uh, and NASA is not uh, independent of the administration. He does a great job and is from uh, California, uh, from the business community here. And Larry Irving, the assistant secretary of commerce, uh, who is playing such a key role in our uh, task force and has been doing an outstanding job. Well, this is quite an event. And let me begin by saying that it is great to be here at the television Academy today. I feel as if I have a lot in common with those of you who are members of the Academy. Uh, I, I was on Letterman. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I write my own lines. I'm still waiting for residuals. Um, at first, I, I thought that Letterman uh, show could lead to a whole new image, maybe, maybe a new career. Uh, no more Leno jokes about being stiffer than the Secret Service or about being so stiff you need a strobe light to make it look like I'm moving. Um, I, thought, I, I thought maybe it would even lead to an opportunity to do some other shows. And I was just thrilled when I was uh, asked uh, by Star Trek, the next generation, to uh, to come on the show and do a guest shot 
I was in crestfallen when they made it clear that they wanted me to replace Lieutenant Commander Data. Um, <laughs> the historian Daniel Borston, who used to be the Librarian of Congress, once wrote that for Americans, nothing has happened unless it is on television. This, of course, leaves out a few major events in our history, but this meeting today is on television, so apparently uh, it is actually occurring, and it's great to be here. <laughs> I, I join you to outline not only this administration's vision of the national information infrastructure, but our proposals for creating it. Last month in Washington, I set forth some of the principles behind our vision. Today, I'll talk about the legislative package necessary to ensure the creation of national infrastructure in a manner which will connect and empower the citizens of this country through broadband interactive communication. We've all become used to stumbling over cliches in our efforts to describe the enormity of the change that is now underway and the incredible speed with which it is taking place. Often we call it a revolution, the digital revolution. And speaking of stumbling over cliches, I often used to use the analogy to uh, automobiles, saying that if cars had advanced as, it rap as rapidly as computer chips over the last few years, a, a Rolls Royce would go a million miles per hour and cost only 25 cents. That is, I used to use it until I used it at a meeting of computer experts, and one of them spoke up and said, yeah, but the Rolls-Royce would be about one millimeter long. <laughs> In any event, what we have been seeing with this incredible pace of change, especially in the last decade, really is amazing. But even this change is nothing compared to what will happen in the decade ahead. The word revolution by no means overstates the case. But this revolution is based on traditions that go far back in our history. Since the transcontinental telegraph that transmitted Abraham Lincoln's uh, election victory, where they were Count, uh, assembling the vote totals in the East all the way to California in real time for the first time in history, our ability to communicate electronically has informed and shaped America. It was only a year before that election that the Pony Express was the talk of the nation, able to send a message across our nation in seven days. Of course, the next year it was, of course, out of business. Today's technology has now made uh, possible a global community united by instantaneous information and analysis. Protesters at the Berlin Wall communicated with their followers through CNN news broadcasts. The fax machine connected us with demonstrators in Tiananmen Square. And so it's worth remembering that while we talk about this digital revolution as if it's about to happen, in many places it is already underway, even in the White House. Let me give you an example. The, the day after the inauguration, I was astonished to see how relatively primitive the White House communications system was. President Clinton and I took a tour and found operators actually having to pull cords for each call that came in and plug them into the right jack in order to complete the connection. It reminded me of the switchboard uh, used by Ernestine, that uh, wonderful character created by Lily Tomlin. And there were actually phones like these, straight from the White House. They're still there. We have made some progress. They're only in the press room now. Um, <laughs> But these phones, these phones just didn't meet our needs. So now we use modern phones. And on trips, I use a cellular phone like this one, which some of you uh, have probably uh, used. Has that ever happened to you when you, excuse me, hello? A gracious hello. Have I reached? 
Hey, hello? Hey, have, I, have I reached the party to whom I am speaking? Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Uh, this, is, this is the vice president. The vice president? Al Gore. Al Gore? Al Gore, little Albert? <gasps> oh, my goodness. This is Ernestine, the operator. <gasps> my wires must have got crossed. I was trying to reach the vice president of AT&T. That, that's a little company I work for sometimes. Um, well, he may be here somewhere, but uh, can, perhaps I can help you. Uh... I'm sure you can help me. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. I think maybe you can help me after all. <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad that I have this time with you. Mm. I must admit that I have been somewhat a technophobe. Me and my switchboard have been codependent. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly, I, I mean, uh, I'm not sure exactly which, which, t which track to take. Well, we're... Are you sure you can help me? Well... <laughs> we're, we're here talking about uh, the the information revolution that's is going to provide lots and lots of information to yes, people. Yes, but it's been so hard to change. First I had to give up the bell. There is no ringy dingy anymore. <laughs> there, there's only this kind of low muffled buzz. And I never see a, re a repairman anymore. That's the part I really miss. <laughs> but I want to be a futurist, Mr. Vice President. I want to be a futurist like you, because I think, well, frankly, I'd have a better future. <laughs> well, you may have come to the right place, because we're talking about all of these new changes and all of the new information it's going to provide to people. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Let me pretend that I know nothing about this. See if this is an accurate description. Is it kind of like billions and billions of tiny little bako bits of valuable information strewn in every direction across that great salad bar in cyberspace? S is that it? That's close. Now, does, does that sound that's... more like your local sizzler? Well, you've, you've got the part about the bits right. It does involve uh -huh. lots of bits. You know, but what I really want to know is who's going to connect those bits? Is it going to be the electronically elite or is it going to be all of us, the people? Well, as a matter of fact, that's also one of the things we're talking about here. And we're trying to design it in a way that will help the people and will help mm -hmm. you, Ernestine. Me? You. You're not counting me as one of the people, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well... Yes, and we've got this problem in the White House I was telling these folks about earlier, and we're trying to get rid of the old switchboard. Now, uh -huh. you know about these billions of bits. Do you think you might be willing to give up your switchboard and equipment and help, help us in the White House? Have access to your telephone calls in a heartbeat. Here, give this to the Smithsonian. <laughs> I'm going to go now to the library so that I can cram and fill up with information and lots of those little info bits. It's been a pleasure. Give my best to Tipper. <laughs> she is terrific. Our new ways of communicating after this revolution will entertain as well as inform. And more importantly, they will educate, promote democracy, and save lives. And in the process, they will also create a lot of new jobs. In fact, they're, they're already doing it. The impact on America's businesses will not be limited just to those who are in the information business, like Ernestine. Uh, virtually every business will find it possible to use these new tools to become more competitive. And by taking the lead and quickly employing these new information technologies, America's businesses will gain enormous advantages in the worldwide marketplace. And that is important because if America is to prosper, we must be able to manufacture goods within our borders and sell them, not just in Tennessee, but Tokyo, not just in Los Angeles, but Latin America. 
Last month when I was in Central Asia, the president of Kyrgyzstan told me his eight-year-old son came to him and said, Father, I have to learn English. But why? President Akayev asked. Because, Father, the computer speaks English. Well, by now we're becoming familiar with the ability of the new communications technologies to transcend international boundaries and bring our world closer together. But many of you are now in the process of transcending other old boundaries, the boundary lines which have long defined different sectors of the information industry. The speed with which these boundaries are eroding is quite dramatic. I'm reminded uh, of an idea of Stephen Hawking, the British physicist. Hawking has Lou Gehrig's disease, but thanks to information technology, he can still communicate not only with his students and colleagues, but with millions around the world. Incidentally, I read the other day that his voice box has an American accent because it was developed here in California. Anyway, in that American accent, uh, Hawking has speculated about a distant future when the universe stops expanding and begins to contract. Eventually, all matter comes colliding together in what he calls the big crunch, which many scientists say could then be followed by another big bang, a universe expanding outward once again. Our current information industries, cable, local telephone, long distance uh, telephone, television, film, computers, and others, seem headed for a big crunch, big bang of their own. The space between these diverse functions is rapidly shrinking. Between computers and televisions, for example, or between interactive communication and video. But after the next big bang in the ensuing expansion of the information business, the new marketplace will no longer be divided along current sectoral lines. There may not be cable companies or phone companies or computer companies as such. Everyone will be in the bit business, and I don't mean the Baco bit business. The functions provided will define the marketplace. There will be information conduits, information providers, information appliances, and information consumers. That's the future. It's easy to see where we need to go, it's hard to see how we get there from here. When faced with the enormity and complexity of the transition, some retreat to the view best enunciated years ago by Yogi Berra when he said, what we have here is an insurmountable opportunity. <laughs> Not long ago, this transition did seem too formidable to contemplate. But that is no longer the case because a remarkable consensus has now emerged throughout our country in business, in public interest groups, and in government. This consensus begins with agreement on the right specific questions we must answer together. How can government ensure that the information marketplace emerging on the other side of this big crunch will permit everyone to be able to compete with everyone else for the opportunity to provide any service to all willing customers. Next, how can we ensure that this new marketplace reaches the entire nation? And then, how can we ensure that it fulfills the enormous promise of education economic growth, and job creation. Today, I'll provide our administration's answers to those questions. But before I do, let me state my firm belief that legislative and regulatory action alone will not get us where we need to be. This administration argued in our national performance review last year that government often acts best when it sets clear goals acts as a catalyst for the national teamwork required to achieve them, and then lets the private and nonprofit sectors move the ball downfield. It was in that spirit that then Governor Clinton and I, campaigning for the White House in 1992, set as a vital national goal, 
linking every classroom in every school in the United States to the national information infrastructure. It was in this same spirit that less than a month ago, I pointed out that when it comes to telecommunications services, schools are the most impoverished institutions in our society. And, and that has to change. And so I have been pleased that so many companies participating in the communications revolution are now talking about voluntarily providing free access to the NII for every classroom in their service areas. And I would like to take the opportunity today to congratulate two companies, Bell Atlantic and TCI, for their joint announcement yesterday in which they both individually committed to do just that. That's leadership from the private sector. <laughs> Setting goals for ourselves is important. Setting the right goals is critical. So let me be clear here today in articulating what I believe is one of the most important goals for all of us to agree to at this meeting. That by January 11th of the year 2000, you will connect and provide access to the national information infrastructure for every classroom, every library, and every hospital and clinic in the entire United States of America. I challenge all of the CEOs who are on the panel and in the audience during the CEO summit at the end of the day to make this commitment at the conclusion of your meeting. And then to challenge in turn the CEOs of every other company in your industries to accept and help us meet this goal. If you will make this commitment today, our administration will issue the same challenge to state regulators, governors, mayors, school boards, teachers, librarians, hospital administrators, and citizens throughout this country. By meeting this challenge, we can realize the full potential of the information revolution to educate, to save lives, provide access to health care, and lower medical costs. Our nation can and must meet this challenge. The best way to do it is by working together. Just as communications industries are moving to the unified information marketplace of the future, so must we move from the traditional adversarial relationship between business and government to a more productive relationship based on consensus. We must build a new model of public-private cooperation that, if properly pursued, and bring great benefits to the American people and avoid the huge transaction costs which are often associated with the old adversarial approach. But make no mistake about it, one way or another, we will meet this goal. The American people want it, industry supports it, our future demands it. It is one of the principal reasons we are moving this year on national telecommunications reform. As I announced last month, we will shortly introduce a legislative package that aggressively confronts the most pressing telecommunications issues and is based on five principles. This administration will encourage private investment, provide and protect competition, provide open access to the network, take action to avoid creating a society of information haves and nots, and encourage flexible and responsive governmental action. Many of you have our white paper today outlining the bill in detail. If you did not get your copy, it's available on the internet right now. Let me run through the highlights with you briefly and talk about how they grow out of our five principles. We begin with two of our basic principles, the need for private investment and fair competition. The nation needs private investment to complete the construction of the national information infrastructure. And competition is the single most critical means of encouraging that private investment. I referred earlier to the use of the telegraph 
uh, to bring the news here to California in 1960 of Abraham Lincoln's election. Congress had funded Samuel Morse's first demonstration project for the telegraph in 1844. Morse then suggested to the Congress that a national system be built by the government. But Congress said no and insisted that private investment be used to build that information infrastructure. And that's what happened to the great and continuing competitive advantage of our country to this day. Today, we must choose competition again and protect it against both suffocating regulation on the one hand and unfettered monopolies on the other. To understand why competition is so important, we need only recall what has happened since the breakup of AT&T 10 years ago this month. As recently as 1987, AT&T was still projecting that it would take until the year 2010 to convert 95 percent of its long-distance network to digital technology. Then it became pressed by the competition, and as a result, AT&T made its network virtually 100 percent digital by the end of 1991. Meanwhile, over the last decade, the price of interstate long-distance service for the average residential customer declined over 50 percent. Now it's time to take the next step. We must open the local telephone exchanges, those wires and switches that link homes and offices to the local telephone companies. The pressure of competition on the information superhighway will be great, and it will drive continuing advancements in technology, quality, and cost. Incidentally, um, when I first coined the phrase information superhighway 15 years ago, I was not prepared for some of the unusual images it would ultimately bring into our language. For example, one businessman made this uh, point I'm making here about competition and the pressure of competition when he told me last week that his company was accelerating its investments in new technology to avoid ending up as roadkill on the information superhighway. And just this week, I received a letter from a group of companies wanting to be allowed to compete who complained that they were scared of being parked at the curb on the information superhighway. In any event, to take one example of what competition means, cable companies, electric utilities, and long-distance companies must be free to offer two-way communications and local telephone service. To accomplish this goal, our legislative package will establish a federal standard that permits entry to the local telephone markets. Moreover, the FCC will be authorized to reduce regulation for telecommunications carriers that lack market power. We expect open competition to bring lower prices and better services. But let me be clear, we insist upon safeguards to ensure that new corporate freedoms will not be translated into sudden and unjustified rate increases for telephone customers. The advancement of competition will necessarily require more opportunity as well for the regional bell operating companies. Current restrictions on their operations are themselves the legacy of the breakup of AT&T and must now be reexamined. The administration endorses the basic principles of the Brooks Bill, which proposes a framework for allowing long distance and local telephone companies to compete against each other. Regulation and review of this framework should be transferred from the courts to the Department of Justice and the Federal Communications Commission. This process of change must be carefully calibrated. We must make sure that the regional bells will not be able to use their present monopoly positions as unfair leverage into new lines of business. That is why the administration supports the approach of the Brooks-Dingle provision that requires the approval of the Department of Justice and the FCC before the regional bells may provide inter-exchange services, most notably in long distance. In working with Congress, the administration will explore the creation of incentives for the regional bells. We want to increase the transparency of these facility-based local services that raise concerns associated with cross-subsidization 
and abuses of monopoly power. Our view of the entry of small local telephone companies uh, or local telephone companies generally into cable television also balances the advantages of competition against the possibility of competitive abuse. We will continue, therefore, to bar the acquisition of existing cable companies by telephone companies within their local service areas. We need this limitation to ensure that no single giant entity controls access to homes and offices. But to increase diversity and benefit consumers, we will permit telephone companies to provide video programming over new open access systems. Even these measures, however, may not eliminate all scarcity in the local loop. Uh, of course, the local loop meaning those information byways that provide that last electronic connection with homes and offices. Uh, for some time in many places, there are likely to be only one or two broadband interactive wires probably owned by cable or telephone companies. In the long run, the local loop may contain a wider set of con competitors offering a broad range of interactive services, including wireless, microwave, and direct broadcast satellite. But for now, we cannot assume that competition in the local loop will end all of the accrued market power of past regulatory advantage and market domination. We cannot permit uh, the creation of information bottlenecks that adversely affect information providers who use the highways as a means of supplying their customers, nor can we permit bottlenecks for information consumers who desire programming that may not be available through the wires that currently enter their homes or offices. Preserving the free flow of information requires open access, our third basic principle. How can you sell your ideas, your information, your programs, if an intermediary who is also your competitor has the means to unfairly block your access to customers? We cannot subject the free flow of content to artificial constraints at the hands of either government regulators or would-be monopolists. We must also guard against unreason unreasonable technical obstacles. We know how to do this. We've seen this problem in our past. For example, when railroad tracks were different sizes, a passenger could not travel easily from a town served by one railroad to a town served by another. But the use of standardized tracks permitted the creation of a national system of rail transport. Accordingly, our legislative package will contain provisions designed to ensure that each telephone carrier's networks will be readily accessible to other users. We will create an affirmative obligation to interconnect and to afford non-discriminatory access to network facilities, services, functions, and information with the customer keeping the same telephone number. We must also ensure the future of non-commercial broadcasting. There must be public access to the information superhighway. Now, these measures will preserve the future within the context of our present regulatory structures. But in our view, that's not enough. We must move toward a regulatory approach that encourages investment, promotes competition, and secures open access. And one that's not just a patchwork quilt of old approaches, but is instead a new approach that promotes fair competition in the future. We begin with a simple idea. Similar entities must be treated similarly. But let's be clear, our quest for equal treatment of competing entities will not blind us to the economic realities of the new information marketplace where apparent similarities may mask important differences. This idea is best expressed in the story about the man who went into a restaurant and ordered the rabbit stew. When it came, he took a few bites and called the manager over and said, this doesn't taste like rabbit stew. It tastes, well, it tastes like horse meat. The manager was embarrassed and he admitted uh, that he had run out of rabbit and he said, well, I, I, I did put some horse meat in it. The guy said, well, how much 
force meat did you put in it? He said, the manager said, well, it's equally divided. The customer said, well, what do you mean equally divided? He said, well, one rabbit and one horse. <laughs> um, maybe the lesson is obvious. A startup local telephone company isn't the same as a baby bell. What we favor is genuine regulatory symmetry. That means that regulation must be based on the services that are offered and the ability to compete, not on corporate identity, regulatory history, or technological process. For example, our legislative package will grant the Federal Communications Commission the future authority under appropriate conditions to impose non-discriminatory access requirements on cable companies. As cable and telephone service uh, become harder and harder to distinguish, this provision will help to ensure that labels derived from past regulatory structures are not translated into inadvertent and unfair competitive advantages. As different services are grouped within a single corporate structure, we must ensure that these new con combined entities are not caught in a crossfire of conflicting and duplicative regulatory burdens and standards. This administration will not let existing regulatory structures impede or distort the evolution of the communications industry. In the information marketplace of the future, we will obtain our goals of investment, competition, and open access only if regulation matches the marketplace. That requires a flexible, adaptable regulatory regime that encourages the widespread provision of broadband interactive digital services. That's why the administration proposes the creation of an alternative regulatory regime that is unified as well as symmetrical. Our new regime would not be mandatory, but it would be available to providers of broadband interactive services. Such companies could elect to be regulated under the current provisions of the Communications Act or under a new title, Title VII, that would harmonize the, uh, those provisions in order to provide a single system of regulation. These Title VII companies would be able to avoid the danger of conflicting or duplicative regulatory burdens. But in return, they would provide their services and access to their facilities to others on a non-discriminatory basis. The nation would thus be assured that these companies would provide open access to information providers and consumers and the benefits of competition, including lower prices and higher quality services to their customers. This new method itself illustrates one of our five principles, that government must be flexible. Our proposals for symmetrical and ultimately unified regulation demonstrate how we will initiate government action that furthers our substantive principles, but that adapts and disappears as the need for government intervention changes or ends. They demonstrate as well the new relationship of which I spoke earlier, the private and public sectors working together to fulfill our common goals. The principles that I have described thus far will build an open and free information marketplace. They will lower prices, stimulate demand, and expand access to the national information infrastructure. They will, in other words, help to attain our final basic principle, avoiding a society of information haves and have-nots. There was a Washington Post headline last month that read this way, will the information superhighway detour the poor? Well, not if we have anything to do about it. Our administration believes that it is basic to require uh, that all be served. After all, governmental action to ensure universal service has been part of American history since the days of Ben Franklin's post office. We will have in our legislative package a strong mandate to ensure universal service in the future, and I want to explain why. We have become an information-rich society. Almost 100% of households have radio and television, and about 94% have telephone service. 
three quarters of all households have a VCR. About 50, about 60 percent now have cable, and roughly 30 percent of households have personal computers. As the information infrastructure expands in breadth and depth, so too will our understanding of the services that are deemed essential. This is not a matter of guaranteeing the right to play video games. It is a matter of guaranteeing access to essential services. We cannot tolerate, nor in the long run can this nation afford, a society in which some children become fully educated and others do not. In <laughs> nor can we tolerate a society in which some adults have access to training and lifetime education and others do not. Nor can we permit geographic location to determine whether the information highway passes by your door. I've spoken often about a vision of a school child in my hometown of Carthage, Tennessee, being able to come home after school and turn on her computer and plug into the Library of Congress. Carthage is a small town. Its population is only about 2,000. So let me emphasize the point. We must work to ensure that no geographic region of the United States, rural or urban, is left without access to broadband interactive service. So yes, we support opening the local telephone exchange to competition, but we will not permit the dismantling of our present national networks. Now all this won't be easy. It is critically important, therefore, that all carriers must be obliged to contribute on an equitable and competitively neutral basis to the preservation and advancement of universal service. The responsibility to design specific measures to achieve these aims will be delegated to the Federal Communications Commission and, of course, to the states. But where the FCC is concerned, their actions will be required in the legislation. They have the flexibility, and it will be carefully defined. But our basic goal is simple. There will be universal service. That definition will evolve as technology and the infrastructure advance. And the FCC, and we're confident the states as well, will get the job done. Reforming our communications laws is only one element of the administration's NII agenda. We'll be working hard to invest in critical uh, information infrastructure technologies, We'll promote applications of the NII in areas such as scientific research, energy efficiency, and advanced manufacturing. We'll work to deliver government services more efficiently. We'll also update our policies to make sure that privacy and copyright are protected in the networked world. We'll help law enforcement agencies thwart criminals and terrorists who might use advanced telecommunications to commit crimes. And the administration is working with industry to develop the new technologies needed for the Information Infrastructure Initiative. I've been working as well with the First Lady's Health Care Task Force and former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop and others to develop ways we can use networks to improve the quality of health care. Beginning this month, we are concentrating, first of all, on the legislative package that I outlined earlier. We haven't invented all of the ideas that it contains. Representatives Dingell and Brooks, Markey and Fields, Boucher and Oxley, and Senators uh, Hollings in Norway and Danforth have all focused on these issues in constructive ways. In many ways, our legislative goals reflect or complement their work. We expect to introduce our legislative package in short order and to work with Congress to ensure speedy passage this year of a bill that will stand the test of time. Our efforts are not, of course, confined only to government. The people in this room and the private sector in general symbolize the importance of private enterprise. Our economic future will depend in a real sense on your ability to grasp opportunity and turn it into concrete achievement. As we move into the new era, we must never lose sight of our heritage of innovation and entrepreneurship. In some ways, we appreciate that heritage more when we see countries that don't have it. Last month in Russia, I had a chance uh, again to see close up a country that tried to hold back the information age, a country that used to put armed guards in front of copying machines. 
in a way, I guess we should be grateful they did that. It helped to strengthen the desire and courage of the Russian people to bring about the end of communism. My hope now is that Central and Eastern Europe and all the states of the former Soviet Union can use technology and the free market to build democracy and not thwart it. And my hope is that America, born in revolution, can lead the way in this new peaceful world revolution. So let's work on it together. A few months ago, Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize for Literature. It was a proud and signal moment for this country, recognition of an African-American woman who has communicated insight and narrative power to readers all over the world. In her acceptance speech, Toni Morrison used one version of an old story, a parable really, to make an interesting point. It was about a blind old woman renowned for her wisdom and a boy who decided to try to play a trick on her. He captured a small bird, cupped it in his hands, and said to her, old woman, is this bird alive or dead? If she said dead, he planned to set it free and prove her wrong. If she said alive, he planned to quickly crush its life away and prove her wrong. She thought a moment and said, the answer is in your hands. Her point is that the future of language is in our hands, or put more broadly, the future of communications. As we prepare to enter the new millennium, we are learning a new language. It will be the lingua franca of the new era. It is made up of ones and zeros, and bits and bytes. But as we master it, as we bring the digital revolution into our homes and schools, we will be able to communicate ideas and information, in fact, entire Toni Morrison novels, with an ease never before thought possible. And so we meet today on common ground, not to predict the future, but to make firm the arrangements for its arrival. Let us master and develop this new language together. The future really is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we on here? Yes. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I think, given us a, a lot to think about and uh, quite an aggressive agenda. Uh, the vice president has uh, agreed to. Connell will also be with us. In addition, saxophonist and tonight star music director Brantford Marsalis will be here. We begin with Jim Sheridan and Jerry Conlon. In 1974, Jerry Conlon was arrested and convicted for the IRA bombing of a pub outside London. His father and several members of his family were also convicted as part of the bombing conspiracy. None were members of the IRA, and authorities had virtually no evidence against them. After 15 years in prison, Conlon was proved innocent. Jim Sheridan, the Oscar-nominated director of My Left Foot, adapted Conlon's memoir in the name of the father for the screen. It stars Daniel Day-Lewis and Emma Thompson, and we're pleased to have Jerry and Jim with us to talk about this film that's gotten a lot of praise uh, at Oscar time. Welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, tell me why you say that this is more of a film about a father and a son than about injustice. Well, when the script came to me, it came from a friend of mine, Terry George, who was asked to originally write a screenplay by Gabriel Bourne, uh, who's the executive producer on the yeah. film. And the story that Terry had detailed, <coughs> after a lot of conversation with Jerry, was a in story of the Guilford Four injustice. And I was interested yeah. in it. And, you know, 
the people were free out of jail, you know, and I'd remember Jerry walking out of uh, the old Bailey and giving this famous speech that, you know, didn't actually play on American television, yeah. but he basically walked out and said, you know, I spent 15 years in jail for something I didn't do. Uh, I saw my father die in a British prison for something he didn't do, and it had a huge reverberation. Now, it was only when I read the script that I thought, hold on a second, they call it the Guilford Four and the Maguire Seven. Right. You know, the, his father was part of the Maguire Seven and Jerry was part of the Guildford Four. And I thought, well, how can you break a family up like that into component parts? So I thought my idea was to kind of put the family back together again. And the only way to do that was to put the father and son into a situation, you know, obviously in the prison. And I was looking for a story about a good father and Giuseppe Conlon was that. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry's father. He was a saint. A saint. I think so, you know, in lots of ways. He was, you know, it's, it, when you say something about a saint, it almost demeans somebody now in the world, you know, because it sounds like somebody who's dry and arid. He yeah. wasn't like that. He just wasn't a well man. And, uh, but he followed Jerry to England after Jerry got arrested, you know, in a kind yeah. of innocent way uh, to just get Jerry a lawyer. And it's a tragedy. Like, his lawyer was supposed to turn up at his house that night in Belfast and he didn't, and Giuseppe got on the boat, and, you know, he went to Jerry's first aunt's house, who had already been arrested, so they weren't there, and then he went to the next house, and he went in. Meanwhile, the police were, you know, uh, bathering Jerry and getting a confession out of him, and then they turn up at the aunt's house, and Giuseppe's arrested, and he's brought, and it's like Orpheus in the underworld. His dad goes after him into hell to try and mm -hmm. rescue him, and in a way... Giuseppe, to me, represents all the victims, not just the people of West Belfast who are essentially Catholic and would be, you know, tarnished with the name of IRA or whatever, or, you know, the authorities would basically say, you know, well, IRA, once you're from that part of the city. But to me, he represents everybody who suffered, like the Catholics, the Protestants, even the soldiers who, you know, are young kids from the north of England who are 20. Why are they, you know, it's like Giuseppe, though, was the... A, you know, is so quintessentially innocent. Yes. Before, we, I want to come back to you, but Jim, when you went into prison, did you think of your father this way? No, I did not. Uh, the last thing I imagined that my father would end up in prison with me. Yeah. Uh, but I'd seen my father shortly before I was moved to England. He, my mother and father had come to Springfield Road Police Station in Belfast where I was being held. The put in some clothes that had been requested by the RUC because uh, the beaten I received at their hands had left my clothes saturated in blood, which they t they'd stripped off me. So therefore, they had to get me some fresh clothes. And when my mother and father arrived, I actually seen them at the, talking to the death sergeant. And when I made an effort to try and contact them, I was trailed into the toilet by the her by two English policemen and an Irish policeman, and I was given a further beating. And the last thing I thought was that I'm going to bump into my father in prison. So it was an, a tremendous shock to suddenly realize there he was along with me. I, I just couldn't believe it. Here was a man who'd never harmed anyone in his life, uh, was totally anti-violent along with my mother. There, there was no politics ever involved in our house. The only pictures ever in our house were religious pictures. So uh, the enormous shock of not only myself being arrested and tortured and taken to England, but then finding that not only had my father been arrested, but several members of my family had been arrested as well mm. and tainted with uh, evidence which has, was obviously fabricated. 